Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Derwin, it's so good to chat again. And I want to start with a conversation you and I had a few months ago. We were on another show that I do, Church Pulse Weekly. And when we were getting ready for it, uh, we were talking about fishing. And so if you remember, I said to you, apparently the Great Lakes 400 years ago when the explorers were first here were just teeming with fish and you could almost like walk across the backs of fish. The Great Lakes were so full of them. And I said, wouldn't it have been great to live 400 years ago? And you said. I said, uh, no, I'm black. 400 years ago in North America uh, was not um, an epic time to be a black man in North America or an indigenous person as well. And so, yeah. And, and I think one of the, the beauties of that transaction is I think that's the genius of God's love is he allows us to interact and see life from other people's perspectives. And Every human being is made in the image of God. And because our world is broken, we have things like what you call the explorers, the indigenous people called something else. And the African slaves who came, enslaved people came to America, called them something else. But as brothers in Christ, who both share the same faith in Christ, my story was able to inform you to see from my perspective and um, that's what it really takes to love each other, to be humble enough to learn from the other, but also to be unoffendable by legitimate questions. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that didn't offend me. Like it, it didn't. I, it was. I feel like the last year and a half for me has been a whole lot of aha moments like that, Derwin, because we were just joking around. I know how much you like to fish, all that stuff. So it was, it was a really innocent comment. And yet the way you handled it really made me go, oh, of course. Like it just, it was like a new, it was a moment for me where I'm like, yep, yep, he's right. He's right. What do people who look like me, white people, what do we not understand that we need to understand? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, so so let me, let me give uh, an illustration and then engage in that question, right? So- mm. How do you tell a fish that it lives in water? Because all the fish knows is that water is normative, you know? And so when you catch a fish and you bring it out of water, it flops around because this is like an alien environment. Like, wait a minute, you mean outside of this is not water? And so regardless of what time in history you've been born in, there are majority cultures, there are minority cultures. And so in majority cultures, say in North America with our white brothers and sisters, uh, it's like fish living in water and you think everybody else is a fish. But the reality is, is God's creation is multifaceted. It's this incredible mosaic of difference. And it's our differences that make us different for the better if we are willing to learn. Uh, there's this old Jewish philosopher who met Jesus. His name is Paul. And one of the things that he said was, was this, do nothing out of selfish ambition, um, but consider others better than yourselves. That is a profound statement. And so when you're the dominant culture, the world is revolving around you. And so people who aren't like you don't experience the same things that you experience. And so it takes a great deal of humility to say, how do you experience 
life. And so what I would say to my white brothers and sisters, regardless if you're a person of faith or not, is taking time to learn strategically from the others. So just recently, I'm learning that the overwhelming, that that cowboys in America, like every American kid that grew up in my era, like you want to be a cowboy, like John Wayne. Right. We had no idea that like upwards to 30% of cowboys were black because there were never any cowboys in cowboy movies with John Wayne. And yeah, so that's a that's made, a new thing for me too. Yeah. I didn't so know that. the actual person who represents the Lone Ranger was actually a black cowboy from Oklahoma. Did not yeah, know. He, yeah, he was the one whose uh life was the template for the Lone Ranger, right? And and, and so these are these are small, simple things. But then when you make it more complex such as driving while black, such as being followed in a, um, in a store or, or, uh, the housing value, right? Uh, research shows that if a house is owned by a black person in the same neighborhood as white people, the appraisal is much lower. But if you just simply switch the person, the appraisal goes up like that's historical, right? And you look at, um, other issues. So, so what I would say is, is we need a lot more patience with each uh, uh, other. So as a, as a black man, who, by the way, who, by the way, I did a DNA test about six years ago, Hmm. Carrie, I am nearly 25% European. Really? Yeah. My, uh, my mom doesn't know her biological dad, but my mom is about as fair as you are. I have an aunt that is very fair with hazel eyes and blonde hair. And so when I did my DNA, uh, I like to say that I'm on a black Scotsman. I got a little bit of Scotsman in me. Got a bit of Scots in you, Derwin. Okay, uh, yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, as people of color, we need to be less offendable towards people of goodwill but then our white brothers and sisters of the dominant culture must also be humble enough to learn. But then for people of faith, we have this commonality in Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the beautiful theological truths is this, that when Jesus died on the cross, all of our sin died in his body, all the icky, mm-hmm. ugly things. But in the resurrection, this beautiful mystery takes place where we as human beings who follow Jesus come to live in him. So we're literally the body of Jesus. And so how we treat each other is how we're treating Jesus. And a lot of times we allow um, the culture to dictate how we should treat each other instead of Christ. Yeah. One of the things, because I've been on this journey now, like a lot of people have over the last year and a bit. And, you know, it's not that I was insensitive to it before, but I think there's a heightened um, sensitivity to these things for me and to racial justice and racial reconciliation and all those things, Derwin. And uh, I've, I've had you on my other podcast. I've got you back on this podcast now. But um, sometimes when I'll comment publicly on it, like whether that's on social media or whatever, and I'm talking about racial justice, I I will get people, I'm guessing they're white, who will say, oh, you're part of the woke mob now. They got you, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, you know, there have been a lot of moments for me where I'm like, oh, yeah, like, of course, Duran wouldn't want to go back. Or, oh, that's how systemic prejudice works. I get it now. I'm I, like, I'm getting it more than I did in, in the past. What would you say to Caucasian people who are defensive, offended, and who worry that this is part of some kind of agenda? Like you hear that quite yeah, a bit. You know, I'm sure so, you get it way more than I do. Oh yeah, yeah. So so, but you know, I've been getting that response for a long time. Um, but so the first thing that I would do, and, and so being a pastor of a church that is probably fifty-five to sixty percent white. Um, these are normative conversations for us. And here's what's interesting. Right. 
Um, Christians who are white, who come from other churches, struggle with the idea of multi-ethnic church, struggle with the idea of racial justice, but unbelieving white people get it immediately. There's something yeah. about um, American Christianity that almost bakes into it this prejudice aspect. And when yeah. you look throughout the history of the church, particularly in America, 90% of all black denominations exist because of racism in the white church. So when you look at hmm. Jim Crow, when you look at segregation, when you look at civil rights, the white church was not a proponent of promoting justice. I mean, for goodness sakes, there was a, a Christian denomination that started in 1845 because they wanted to keep people enslaved, right? Hmm. So... um the first thing that I do is I sit down and I want to hear their heart. And this is what I've found, Carrie, is for many white conservative evangelical Christians, there's this marriage of the American flag mm -hmm. and Jesus. So if you talk about America in any disparaging way, even if it's historical and factual, it's an affront, they think, to Jesus and also a thing, uh, also an affront to their Protestant work ethic. So this is what I do, is I say to them this, I say, understand this, my great, 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 great grandfather, Moses Davis, fought with the Union against the Confederacy. He fought for the American ideal of liberty and justice for all. The Confederacy, which existed for four years, did not want to be a part of America, and they wanted to keep human beings made in the image of God enslaved. I am a running in my veins is a patriot's spirit. My flesh and blood fought for what this flag stands for. So this isn't just your country. This is all of our country. That's number one. Number two, our identity as followers of Jesus, regardless of your ethnicity, is not in America. America didn't die for you on a cross. Jesus Christ died for you on a cross. Our allegiance is to Jesus first and foremost. Therefore, we can look objectively and say, wow, America has been a beacon of hope and greatness. But like every nation, there are some ugly things. Uh, where I live, Carrie, in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, Catawba indigenous people used to roam this land. That's not the case anymore. Mm. Um, we need to look at that. We need to look at why can I chase trace my genealogy to Charleston, South Carolina, because there is a that's where a lot of enslaved people came that like any family we've got good things and bad things and we have to be able to talk about both of them you cannot have true healing without true recognition thirdly when people of color bring up the past it's number one to show how we got to where we are now and number two it's to help our brothers and sisters look back and let's mourn collectively together. Because when you mourn and when you cry with someone, that bonds your hearts to move forward together. And then lastly, lastly, if you don't remember the past, you're doomed to repeat it. And mm -hmm. so as we look at the United States of America, like we had an insurrection where I saw white police officers getting beat by white men with the American flag on a pole, but I didn't hear anything about Blue Lives Matter then. And so I'm like, so does Blue Lives Matter only when it's a Black Lives Matter protest? Because I've seen policemen getting beat with American flagpoles and I've seen a Confederate flag in the U.S. Capitol. Um, that's, that, is, that is treason. The Confederacy didn't want to be a part of America. And so what I see happening is people are more committed to their late night political TV show host 
than they are actually to scripture. Because the party of the lamb, the kingdom of God, it speaks prophetically both to the progressives and the conservative slash party of Trump. And so it's important to be able to have these conversations, but the defensiveness that you're talking about is actually rooted in idolatry, that it's a strand of white nationalism. And it's very important. So I'm a theologian, um, I'm a biblical scholar, and the United States of America or Canada is not mentioned in the book of Revelation. And it's important for people to understand that the church of Jesus Christ uh, outlasted the Roman Empire, uh, the Crusades, uh, the Middle Ages, and he's going to outlast everything else. And so our allegiance is to Jesus. We are colonies of the new heavens, and new earth in the present to be bringers of justice and mercy. And justice is simply this. I want my neighbor to be treated the way I am, and I want the wrongs to be made right. When you have those conversations with people who are resistant, how do they go or defensive? You know, how do they go? Um, do you ever see people come around or is it kind of oh, yeah. like, well, thanks so much, I'm gone? Uh, uh, overwhelmingly for people who come to our church, they end up staying because what they find out is that the gospel is a bigger and more beautiful story. They've just been told that the gospel is about forgiving sins, but the gospel is not only forgiving sins, it's creating a family of brothers and sisters with different colored skins. And this family loves to, this family learns to love each other. And as we love each other, we not only make each other better, but we give a better glimpse to the world of what Jesus looks like. The image of God is not located in just one ethnic group. Like right. God loves diversity. Like when you look at the universe, when you look just at ocean, like for me, fish, when I look at the difference between a big old ugly catfish and a beautiful sunfish, like you see diversity everywhere. And within humanity, there's only one race, the human race. But God in his genius has created this human race to have different ethnicities and, and, and different cultures and different ways of being. And that's how we grow and learn. For example, Carrie, I have learned from the Canadians. Hmm. You know what I've learned? What have we taught you? You have taught me I am not built for cold weather. <laughs> well, that's a gift to humanity, isn't it? <laughs> hey, listen, in, in the early 2000s, I was speaking somewhere in Canada, Manitoba or something. It was above oh, it gets Minnesota. Cold there. Minnesota yeah. And it was in January. I'm and when so I would sorry. go outside, I ran because my nose hairs would freeze. Correct. And I was like, Lord, these Canadian people have taught me I am not built for this. I spoke in Norway uh, about a decade ago, and I thought it was cold in Canada. So I'm Toronto based, considerably south of Manitoba. And uh, I'm like, oh, my goodness. It was like another level of cold. It was like that very thing. I thought my skin cells were freezing as I walked from the dining hall to where I was speaking that night. Uh, well, I'm glad I'm glad we taught you something. <laughs> um, I'm interested because you said church people seem to have this resistance. And I agree. We've talked yeah. about this with Rick Warren, Tim Keller, you know, that American nationalism is a real issue inside the mm -hmm. church. And it's a, it's a challenge that the church is going to have to deal with. But you said unchurched people seem to get it inherently. Yep. Do you find that it's somewhat generational as well? Because I've noticed yes. like sometimes we're having these conversations and I'm like, man, if a 23-year-old unchurched person heard this, they'd be like, what is the conversation even about? Of course, it's about reconciliation. Of course, it's about justice. Of course, it's about multi-ethnic. Like, yes. What are you yes. finding generationally? Um, I, 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 am, I am finding that generationally, and I think it's quite beautiful, right? And, and so this is where my heartbeat is. Generation Z and, and younger millennials really want to transform the world. Hmm. They want to be a part of justice. They want to be a part of making the world different. And so we see tons of Gen Z and millennials because we tell them this, 
You want to be a part of changing the world? Let me tell you about the one that when he rose from the dead, everything became different. And you can actually join him in healing the world. That salvation is not just salvation of your soul, but it's the salvation of the whole of humanity. And your mm. work is a way to join God in creating something beautiful to make someone else's life better so that they can see Jesus in you. This idea of salt and light also coming out of the 60s and then moving into the 70s. There's this thing called postmodernity and postmodernity was supposed to break down the meta narrative that there's one objective truth, right? Well, what's happened is truth has become individual. I have my own truth. If I mm -hmm. want to say two plus two is 12, then it is because it's true. And I think they're finding disorientation in that, that they want a bigger story to live by, but that bigger story can't just be, hey, we don't like people and uh, Jesus just died for our sins. They want to walk with the Jewish rabbi to touch the leper, to turn over the tables where there's corruption. And so I do think it's generational. Now, for boomers, they came out of communism as a threat, uh, they remember World War II. They remember the chaos of the late 60s. And so there's this ethos of American exceptionalism. Now, listen, I love my country. I think it's awesome. I've traveled all over the world. Uh, we were in Denmark. We were at a, caps, uh, a, a, a taxi guy, and he was talking smack about America. And I'm like, no, I can talk smack about America, but you can't because you've never been. <laughs> um, but here's my point, though. Why do we as Americans have to be the best? Like, mm. like, shouldn't the point of life be, how does my life make other lives better? Mm. And as a Christian, Jesus said these words, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. Right. And so my ethos is, man, Hey, take the creative genius that we learn here and let's multiply it to make the world a better place. Now, as a Christian, I also know that the world is not going to be as beautiful as it can be until the beauty of Jesus finally comes. But it's almost like we can become his paintbrushes and the world is a canvas and we're painting colors of love, painting colors of grace and mercy. Tell me about uh, your childhood, which you outline in the book, Building a Multi-Ethnic Church. Mm. It was, I mean, I've known you for years, but there were things I didn't know about you that you shared in the book. And it was very um, eye-opening. Yeah. So uh, mom was 16. Dad was 18 um, when I was born, around that age. And um they both had various issues. Um, I grew up poor, grew up on welfare, grew up in the hood. Like my whole life was like, you know, like three or four blocks. That's all that I knew. And when everybody else is that way, it just is like gunshots and violence. Like you learn to su survive at about age 13. Um, I learned that if I wanted to be taken care of, it had to be me. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work with abandonment issues. Um, Jesus has been so kind through people, through reading, that by 13, I wasn't going to let anybody close to me because you could hurt me. You could let me down. So mm -hmm. from about 13, I felt like I was an adult and football became my way out of the environment that I was in. I went to an incredible high school where the football coaches taught discipline, self-reliance, teamwork, sacrifice. And I bought into that philosophy. And I was the first male to, in my family to graduate high school. I went to college. I became a football American, one of the best to ever play at Brigham Young. So here I am, a uh, a black kid from the hood, and I go to Brigham Young, which is incredibly diverse. There's multiple shades of white Mormonness, and so that was that was an incredible culture shock. But that taught me how to get along with people because Mormons were different than any other white people I've ever experienced. They have their own culture, and so from my childhood. 
I built these walls around me. And looking on the outside, people would go, that's the American success story. In America, you can go from parents not graduating to getting a degree, you're making money, you're famous. But for all the success I had on the outside, on the inside, I was still grieving. Hmm. Why didn't my dad love me enough to stay? I was grieving. Why did I have to be sexually abused? I was grieving. Even to this day, why am I always going into a restaurant? I know the exits. I'm looking for everybody. Like I'm prepared for danger to happen because that's the way you grow up. Um, I was grieving when I married my wife. I didn't know how to truly love her because I didn't truly know how to love myself. My whole life was built upon performance as a football player. How fast are you? How good are you? How high can you jump? My whole life was just built upon performance until I met him. Mm -hmm. And when I met Jesus, it was like he was the first one who said, son, you can rest now because your performance isn't good enough. As a matter of fact, no one's performance is good enough. That's why I came to perform for you. And in my performance on the cross, you can have life. Do you still, when you go into restaurants, scope out the exits? Or oh, is that yeah. something you've gotten over? Uh, well, unfortunately, Carrie, I live in America. I don't know what it's like up in Canada, but in America, uh -huh. people be shooting up places all the times. And so it is a, uh, now I think I've redeemed that in that it's not a okay. source of anxiety. Now it's just a source of like, man, in America, we love guns. For some re re reason, Americans yeah, love you guns. You got to be prepared, right? You do, sadly. I mean, it is it is tragic that that coping survival skill is something that I still keep. Hmm. Hmm. What other what other residual impact of your childhood are you still working through? Or, you know, feel free to expand that to growing up black in America. What what yeah, is still so, there so, that's like uniquely yours that you're like, yeah, yep, I'm still know, still paying attention. So I would say one of the things that I have a heart for is I have a heart for the marginalized. I have a heart for the uh, discounted. I have a heart for um, those who are neglected because I felt like that was me. Um, I have a heart for women because I've seen women who were close to me be, be physically uh, uh, beaten. And so I have a heart for women. Um, I have a heart for life in the womb. My mother was told in 10th grade, uh, this is 1970, she was told, go to California and abort me. And my wife said, hell no, we don't do that. Hmm. And or, or my mom, my mom said, uh, no, we don't do that. And so to this very day, I'm thankful for her courage hmm. to bring me into the world. And so my mom and I have really grown up together because she's only 17 years older than me. Yeah. Um, you, you, you know, so, so the, I have a heart also for, uh, for men to be husbands and dads. And I'm not a big, even though I played in the NFL, I'm not a big fan of what the American church projects a man to be like years ago to be a man was like, you get on a horse and you ride in the woods. And I'm like, listen, brother, I am black. I ain't getting on a horse. I ain't riding in no woods. I ain't climbing no mountain. I'm not doing any of that stuff. Like a man, Jesus is the ultimate portrait of a man. Bring the children to me. He touched the lepers. He got in the faces of the religious leaders, right? Um, he was humble. He was strong. He was brave. It, it, it's this multifaceted picture. It's not a dude with a Bass Pro Shop hat on with a bow shooting at something. That could be a part of it, but that's not the only thing. So growing up without a dad, I wanted to be 
a very present dad and a very loving dad. But one of the things that I learned, the most important dad that I could be is a repenting dad. And here's what I mean by that. No parent is going to be perfect. And the best thing a parent can do is model the need for grace and asking their children for grace and pointing them to the one who is grace. Let's you know, talk and, about the NFL. Go ahead. Well, and and I was going to say one 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 vivid experience. I, I remember being eight years old, and this plays into my passion to see racial reckon. I was about eight years old and I went into a restaurant with my mom. We sat down and this drunk white man stood up and said, I remember when you blankety blank N words couldn't eat with us good white folks. And I remember um, a black gentleman standing up to basically go take care of him. And his wife said, baby, he's not worth it. And somehow wow. God left that imprint in my mind. And this is who I feel sorry for, Carrie. I feel more sorry for the person who was spewing those words than the people those words were coming upon. Because to dehumanize another person means the depth of your dehumanity is at toxic levels. And so that also plays out. I, I want to see people set free from the bondage of hate. Hmm. I'll echo that, Derwin. Let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit, talk about the NFL. So you played for a number of years in the NFL and a lot of leaders here, whether that's church leaders, business leaders are committed to creating a multi-ethnic environment. I think that's one thing in the last year and a half that's really come into clear focus for so many organizations, so many leaders. What did you learn about creating a multi-ethnic environment or culture, good, bad, and ugly in the NFL? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, what I learned in the NFL is, is, is this. Only one thing matters, win. That's all. Okay. It's win. And so what the general manager, the ownership, and the coaches do is they want to assemble a team that helps you win. Now, by right the time on. you get to the NFL, you are conditioned to do a couple of things. Number one, find your role. Number two, earn your job. And number three, help your team win. And so what happens is, is when you come together as a team, you've got a playbook, there's a culture. And at the end of the day, you don't ask a guy, so I noticed you're white, so we can't play together. Like what, like what comes first is winning. And then you work on those secondary issues and things. Now, have there been, uh, I remember in college at BYU, there was a linebacker and uh, another player team got into an argument, white and black guy, and the white guy called the black dude the N-word, but the black dude threatened the white guy's family, right? So both of them were wrong. And so mm-hmm. we've seen in the NFL that you have a diversity of opinions. But here's the thing. When the whistle is blown and you start playing, your teammates are your teammates. Hmm. And so there are guys that I would have never been friends with outside of the NFL who I would have never connected with. Um, There was a guy named Kurt Loudermilk, and he was an old, crusty center. And we would have never connected outside of a locker room. But because we were friends, there was like this incredible bond. But also, even within the black players, there's incredible diversity. Incredible diversity. Um, you, You know, so what I would say is this. When you understand the vision and when you understand your role and when you sacrifice, you can win. So for me as a pastor to build a multi-ethnic churches, we have the ultimate vision. Love God, love your neighbor as you love, love yourself. We have the ultimate role. God gives us all spiritual gifts, and then we sacrifice for each other. But in the midst of that, there's this thing called humility. Humility says, I am willing to relearn some things in order to love. Now, that's helpful. Uh, because we have a lot of leaders trying to build a healthier, more multi-ethnic 
organization. Uh, what are some What are some things that a true multi ethnic organization is not? In other words, people say, "Oh, we're multi ethnic," and you're like, "No, you're not." What would yeah. What would okay. be so, some some false signs that you think you're multi ethnic, but you're not? Yeah. So the aspect of truly being multi ethnic starts with who makes the decisions. So in my mm. world as a pastor and as an equipper of other pastors and influencer of churches, um, who makes the decisions at the church? Because a lot of times uh, what I've found and what I research in my latest book is uh, a lot of the mega churches in America are considered quote unquote multi-ethnic because not one ethnic group makes up more than 80% but the leadership of the church will be overwhelmingly white. And then the issues of the other people are not communicated. So a true multi-ethnic church has a diversity of perspectives ethnically and life experience wise. So when we planted Transformation Church, my first hire 11 years ago was a 54 year old white guy. Number one, he was qualified, but number two, He had cultural and life experiences I didn't have. Number three, it spoke volumes that we were serious about this. Hmm. So therefore, it has to be reflected in the leadership. And here's why, Kerry, is I'm not smart enough to know everything. And so we need other perspectives and life vantage points to look at the same issue. And we see this throughout the scriptures of diversity of leadership. So that's number one. Number two is how do people who are marginalized the most feel? Do they think that you have their back? Mm -hmm. Do they think that you support them? And so when you have a diversity of leadership, you consider other people that your culture represents. So those are the two biggest things is representation by identification and then speaking into the issues of people who are hurting. So, for example, as a former NFL player, it hurt me deeply that a lot of fans said, hey, listen, when we come to a game, we just want to see the game. We don't want to we don't want to hear nothing about racial injustice or any of these things. And I'm like, so let me get this right. You just want me to get you fantasy football points, but you don't care about my life outside of the field. Mm. I love you too much to not allow you to grow in your humanity. And Mm. sports has always played a vital role in changing culture and society, just like music has as well. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, people would make the argument that has no place in sports. What's your take on that? (laughs) Like whether that's kneeling for the national anthem, that kind of thing. What's what's your take on that? Well, the first thing is I think we need to understand some things. When I played in the NFL in the 90s, very rarely were we as players out on the field for the national anthem. Hmm. I only remember a few times actually being out on the field for the national anthem. Number two, the U.S. military paid the NFL a lot of money to get players to be out on the field for the national anthem so that they could recruit for all these wars that we're continuing to fight in the Middle East. Um, So am I all for my country? Yeah, but personally... um, I'm like, man, stay in the locker room. Like when people go to work, do they play the national anthem like at their jobs? So there's a bigger game that's being played that we have to look through that I love my country. I love being an American, but I love being a part of the kingdom of God more. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's a different perspective for sure. What are some other keys to creating a truly multi-ethnic, diverse organization? Okay, so this one right here is the simplest, but it's the hardest. Who is sitting around your dinner table that is ethnically and culturally different than you? But not only are they sitting around your dinner table, do your kids look up to them? 
do you receive knowledge from them? Because a lot of times, majority culture people have relationships with other ethnicities and it's a paternalistic relationship. Like, oh, I'm helping you. What person of color is pouring into your life? Who is encouraging you? Um, Like for the leaders that are listening, who are the leaders of color that you're getting information from? So for me in my world as a pastor, after about four years, I stopped going to pastor conferences because I was receiving the same information from the same kinds of people repackaged. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, if you do the same thing, you're going to get the same results. And the results of what I see in America for the, for Christians is not that awesome. So I need to change that around. You know, and and so who's around your dinner t- 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 table? Like, like who do you break bread with? Who are you close to? Who's teaching you something that you didn't previously know? Yeah, how do you begin that? Because I've 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 heard that at different times, and the thought has challenged me. And it's something my wife and I are working at. On we're we're in a particularly Caucasian area. It's not that there aren't diversity, but I mean a lot of people who look like me uh, live around here. So we we joined um, or started a Be the Bridge, Bridge group where we are very intentional. I don't know that you know that program or not, but mm-hmm. you know we're in with a diverse group, so we're hanging out with them, that kind of stuff. What would you yep. say for leaders who are like, yeah, my dinner table, like come to my backyard on a summer night, it's not very diverse. Where do you yeah. start? So I would I would say if you're not a person of, of, of faith, just just like meditate and begin to think about who are different people other than me that I would like to connect with at the office or at the gym. If you are a person of faith, then begin to pray about, you know, God, bring people that are different into my life. Like it has to be intentional. So there's one thing that leaders do that make them lead well. They are intentional. And so this has to be a step of intentionality. So one of the intentional steps that I take, Carrie, is I go to coffee shops and I pray. I say, Lord, there are hurting people all around. Will you bring hurting people to me? People that are different, Hmm. um, people that are older, people that are younger, bring them to me to build relationships with. And it is amazing. Over the years, the conversations and the relationships that I have that have developed, but you have to be intentional about carving that time out. Mm. Yeah, and being intentional about even asking the question rather than thinking it's going to happen by osmosis. On the days I've gotten it right, it's amazing. I, from my faith perspective, what God sends along the way. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. here you go. Yeah, Um, leaders are intentional. If you're not intentional, you're being intentional about not making these relationships. So the church is not very integrated. It's not very diverse at this point. I think, you know, the old cliche that that, uh, America is still segregated at 11 a.m. on on Sunday morning, right? The most segregated hour. Um, You've hinted at it already. There are some historic reasons for that. Any other reasons for the church and then other industries that may be or... Um, fields, sectors that are very undiversified and why? Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me, let me throw this caveat first. And I I think this is really important. As a pastor, the goal is not diversity. The goal is to love each other well and beautifully. Mm -hmm. Jesus said these words, love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love is more than sentimentalism. Love is more than feelings. Love is a commitment to the betterment of the other, which requires sacrifice on our part. So that's number one. Number two is um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear of the other. Um, Number three, let's just call it what, what it is, prejudice is real. People of color can be prejudiced also. That's individual. Racism is systemic or structural. And most 
conservative people struggle with the idea of systemic racism. So what I mean by systemic racism is, for example, the city of Charlotte was developed a certain way. And years ago, black people could only live in a certain part of the city. That's called red lining. Mm -hmm. And so you couldn't get loans outside of that red line. Okay. So that is an example of systemic. And so racism and prejudice is real. Um, Also, I do think that a big distraction has come about too. This idea that if you're against racism and sexism and classism, somehow that that's woke. Well, if Mm. that's being woke, then Jesus was wide awake then. Because last I checked, um, he broke down ethnic barriers with Samaritans and a Samaritan woman. Um, He was with Gentiles. Um, He was with the poor. He was with the lame. He was with the disenfranchised. And he was with the wealthy. Jesus is an everybody type of a person. And so I, in my work over the last seven months, I've been incredibly frustrated by how now I have to dismantle the arguments of being woke before I can actually get to the real sin. And so there's a lot of people within the church who are saying, oh, well, you know what? That's woke. So I'm not even going to be a part of it. Like I actually loathe that word woke because of the distraction that it's become. And so what I like to say is this, Jesus made it clear love your neighbor as you love yourself. How is that bearing weight in your life? And one of the ways that you know that you're growing in love for the other is things that affect the other begin to affect you. Hmm. Hmm. That's a great line. That's a great line. Got to ask you a couple more questions. Why do you think there's so much pushback to the idea of systemic racism? So, um, you know, I am a, I'm a person of faith. I think number one, that there are dark powers of evil that love division. Number two, I think it pushes against the white Protestant work ethic motif. Hmm. You know, in America, you're taught you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be if you just work hard enough. So here's a question. Tell that to a Native American in 1802. They can be anything they want to be. Tell that to a woman who couldn't vote until 1920. Tell that to a Black person in Alabama who could not even exercise their freedom to vote as an American citizen because of the voting tax. Tell that to the Mm. churches in Birmingham, Alabama that were bombed so much that Alabama, Birmingham was called bombing ham. And so it smacks against this work ethic. And one of the things that I find is if you say systemic injustice, a lot of white Christians will go, well, that's a personal attack against me. So so let me give you an example, uh, Kerry. Mm. When I was a kid, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just okay. agreeing with so you. So when I was when a kid, kid in elementary school, there were a lot of right-handed desks. So when I sat down, I could write on my desk because I was right-handed. Well, I had friends who were left-handed, but they had to write on a right-handed desk. Both of mm-hmm. us worked equally as hard, but it was easier for me because I had right privilege. Hmm. Left-handed people had to work harder because the desk was made for them. Well, in the United States of America, when you look historically, it was created with a Eurocentric dominant world view. It doesn't mean that white people haven't worked hard. It just meant that their ethnicity and culture was not a hindrance to their hard work. So we've covered an awful lot. If somebody wants to take a couple of steps, one or two steps toward yeah. um, 
a more racially just organization, church, business, whatever, team. What are some first steps you would recommend, Derwin? The first thing that I would do is I would sit down, get in a quiet place. And if you're a believer, I would say, Spirit of God, help me to see my prejudice and blind spots. If you're not, sit down, meditate, and say, okay, where are my prejudices and where are my blind spots? Um, Number two, I would begin to say, okay, give me friends that I can learn from, and I want to connect deeply with them. Uh, Number three, um, I would would read my book, and um, that is a shameless plug because I think it's the best book on the topic. Um, Yeah, and I would say the principles are broad enough, even though it's building a multi-ethnic church, the principles, I would say, are broad enough that you could implement in pretty much any organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and Carrie, you know this as well. When you look at business innovation, right? Yeah. Steve Jobs was Syrian. Mm. When you look at the founders of Google, they also were immigrants. So when you look at the history of America, we all came from somewhere else. And even in Canada, except for the indigenous people that were there. And so it comes down to this, have a table so big that everybody can sit at it and eat well and conversate and learn from each other. It's a posture of humility and generosity. Derwin, that's fantastic. Dr. Derwin Gray, the book is called Building a Multi-Ethnic Church. So where can people find you online these days, Derwin? Yeah, go to Derwin L. Gray. Dot com. That's D-E-W-I-N-G-R-L, <laughs> DerwinLGray.com. That's gray with an A. Okay, great. And um, yeah, and you're also pretty active on social as well. Derwin, once again, it's been a joy. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, good sir. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.